nonlinear equations and their graphs. So to recap, we know about linear equations and we know that they're particularly simple. What that means is that they limit our ability to study more complex, interesting economic relationships. And we know that within a linear relationship, the change in x always causes the same exact change in y. In other words, the slope of a linear equation is a constant. For example, in this graph, when we increase x from 0 to 1, y increases by 10. When we increase x from 1 to 2, y increases by 10. And when we increase x from 2 to 3, y increases by 10. The slope is exactly the same along this entire line. In this case, it's equal to 10. Now we know that some economic relationships tend to be linear by nature. For example, budget constraints. Budget constraints are something that you'll uh, see in intermediate micro theory. And we can write budget constraints with m as income, p sub x as the unit price of a good x, and p sub y as the unit price of a good y. So what this equation telling us is what this equation is telling us is that all your money, m, your budget, your income is spent on the summation of what you spend on good x and what you spend on good y. And we can rearrange this and solve for y and graph this out and we get our simple uh, linear budget constraint. And even those economic relationships that are nonlinear can actually be transformed into linear equations which makes it easier to estimate using real data. So for example, economists are often interested in growth and in particular income. So we can look at an income growth model, which is nonlinear, where we're going to have GNP as a measure of a nation's income. We're going to have our base E, which is just a constant, and we're going to have a variable T, which is time. And so this is just one example of an economic growth model. And you can see that it's nonlinear. We'll talk more about this actual function later on. But this can be transformed using logs, and you're not expected to know how to do this just yet. But this is just an example showing you that by transforming the equation on the left hand side, which is nonlinear, using logs, we can create a linear equation. So we know that most economic relationships are nonlinear and we like to model them as such. Why? Well, first, a variable may be increasing for some values and decreasing for others. So if you remember the Laffer curve, which shows total revenue as a function of taxes. So for some values of the tax rate, to tax revenue increases, and then for other values, it falls. Clearly nonlinear. And a variable may be increasing or decreasing at non-constant rates. So if we look at this population growth model again, but close up, we can see that if for example, time, this x variable, were to increase by 20, GNP would increase by 39.4, which gives us a slope between these two points, these two ordered pairs of 1.97. Well, let's go further. If I were to increase t by the same exact amount, the change in x or the change in t is still 20, my change in y or that change in GNP is now 58.7. So now I have a higher slope. My slope is now 2.94. In other words, sometimes variables can increase, but they can increase at different rates. And vice versa, they may decrease at different rates. So what exactly is a nonlinear equation? In short form, a nonlinear equation is anything that's not a linear equation. But let's be a little bit more formal. A nonlinear equation is an equation that when graphed does not produce a straight line. Variables in a nonlinear equation can definitely have roots and exponents, and they can be multiplied or divided by one another. And your variables can be, in your exp can be exponents. So equations that do not meet the above criteria are linear equations. These expressions are examples of linear equations. 2 squared x equals 1, 2x plus 10y equals 0, q sub d equals a minus bp. And the last equation here may be a little tricky because at first it looks like a nonlinear equation. It says y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. So you see that square above the x. But reading on, you see further that, hey, you have to impose that a equals 0 on this equation. And when you do that, the equation actually simplifies to a linear equation. Now these are examples of nonlinear expressions. x squared, 2xy plus 4, 
2x divided by 4y, the square root of x, so on and so forth. So again, anything that's not a line is nonlinear. Now let's take a look at some of the common nonlinear functions in our economic applications. Quadratic functions, cubic functions, power functions, exponential, and logarithmic functions. So I don't want you to feel overwhelmed that there are five different types of functions that you need to know. In truth, what I really want to do is just introduce you to these types of functions so that when you look at a graph or when you look at an equation, you can say, oh, that looks like a power function or, oh, that graph looks like it's exponential things like that. The only type of function that I really want you to understand right now for this week are quadratic functions. We'll still go through each one though and define them and briefly talk about them. So that when you go into your intermediate micro, intermediate macro and your development courses and things like that, you, you're familiar with the terms and the equations and the graphs. Let's start with quadratic equations. These are of the form y is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c where a, b, and c are constants, and we see that a doesn't equal zero. We say that a doesn't equal zero because if it did, the quadratic equation would just become a linear equation, and we're not really interested in that. When do we use these guys? Well, a quadratic equation shows a variable that can either increase up to some maximum value and then begin to decrease, in other words, an upside down u, or it can show a variable that decreases down to some minimum and then begins to increase, which is just a u shape. Most commonly, in economics, we see quadratic demand and supply functions. So here I have all four quadrants graphed out. What we're really interested in is this first quadrant. So it becomes a little bit more realistic, our model of demand and supply, because now we have nonlinear supply curves and we have nonlinear demand curves. We also see them used in total revenue and profit functions. For example, we have this upside down or inverted U shape to represent profit. We'll show this later. And we already know that a quadratic equation is also representative of the Laffer curve, which is what you did in one of your labs, the Kuznets curve and the environmental Kuznets curve, which you may or may not have heard of. Then we have cubic functions, which are of the form y is equal to ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d, where a, b, c, and d are now constants. And when we're talking about cubic functions, we can have a equaling to zero because if a equals zero, our cubic function would just become a quadratic function. Now cubic functions are a lot more complicated. They have multiple ups and downs, but most often you'll come across cubic functions when we're talking about cost functions. So a lot of time in your intermediate micro courses, you'll talk about cubic cost functions. And they often look like this, where they start to rise in the beginning of output, then fall, and then begin to rise again. Next we have power functions, which are of the form y is equal to x, b. b here is a constant, and we're allowing b to be any real number. It doesn't have to be 2, 3, 4, it can be negative, it can be a square root, anything that we want it to be. And we use power functions a lot. So in your intermediate micro courses, you're talking about indifference curves or isoquants. You often use power functions. In the graph below, we have a function y is equal to u, which is going to be some constant. For example, I have two graphs here, u is equal to 100 and u is equal to 200. So this function is y is equal to u divided by the square root of x. And you'll also use power functions when talking about production functions. So for example, your Cobb-Douglas production functions in your intermediate macro courses are power functions. So this graph here shows a production function of y is equal to 10 times k to the half. So power functions are a little bit more lenient. They're not as strict as quadratic or cubic functions where that b has to be greater than or equal to 2. An exponential function is of the form y is equal to b to the x, where b is the base constant, which is greater than 0. So notice the difference between an exponential function and a power function. With an exponential function, the independent variable, that x, is the exponent. So again, an exponential function occurs when the independent variable, that x, is in the exponent. With exponential functions, the dependent variable increases or decreases by a fixed proportion per unit of the dependent variable. So whenever you hear population or income doubles every x amount of years, 
that statement is based off of using an exponential function. Now, normally you'll see exponential functions with a natural base, that constant e. Constant e is 2.718, blah, 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 right? Which implies that we have an exponential function or the natural exponential function, y is equal to e to the x. So remember, these b's, this e, they're constants, they're just some number. We use exponential functions a lot in economics. We use them for growth. And when we're modeling growth, that b, that base constant, has got to be greater than 1. So we use growth models or exponential functions to model growth when we're talking about income, population, compound interest. So here's this example again of the growth model. But we can also use it to model decay. It's not often used in economics. Uh, the decay part isn't often used in economics, but we still see it sometimes. So when you're going to use an exponential function to model decay, your B value, that base, has to lie somewhere between 0 and 1. So economists use decay models to uh, model epidemics and depreciation. So this model to the right you can consider to be a, an auto-value depreciation model. So once you get a car and you drive it off the lot, over time that car loses value. And this just models it. So it's telling us that if I were to buy a car at $30,000, that the value, of that is got, the value of that is going to decrease exponentially over time. Really? And finally, logarithmic functions. These are of the form y is equal to log vx, where b is a base constant greater than 1. So I know that logarithmic functions tend to be pretty abstract for students, but the thing to remember is that a log is nothing more than an exponent. So when you think of a logarithmic function, it's just a number. The log of a number is an exponent to which the base must be raised to produce that number. So you can think of logs as just uh, transformations of exponential functions. They're inverses of each other. So for example, if y is equal to b to the x, that's our exponential function, then it's true that log b y is equal to x. Or if we're going to use our constant e, we can say that if y is equal to e to the x, then it's true that the natural log of y is equal to x. Economists often use the natural log. Logarithmic functions are generally used to transform exponential functions or other nonlinear functions into linear equations to be estimated. So this is that example again. We had y is equal to 88 times e to the 0.02t. Again, e is just that constant. But we can use the rules of logs, and you don't know them yet. Many of you don't know them yet, and that's okay. But there are these certain rules that we can use to transform this equation. We can transform it to become, if we take the natural log of both sides of the equation, we have the natural log of y is equal to the natural log of 88 plus, plus 0.02t, which just simplifies to the natural log of y is equal to 4.382 plus 0.02t, which is just a linear equation. And econometricians like to create linear equations because they can create maybe better fits for models.